coming up, an interview with the two principals from a hard rock arena band from the 80s on the story behind one of the catchiest uh, raise your fists in the air, sing it to the top of your lungs, rockers of 1984. I don't know if it's illegal to turn the station when the song comes on the radio, but it should be. <laughs> and it all came from a misheard lyric. The drummer wrote it about his sibling and uh, the lead singer in the band misheard the lyric. He begged him to change it to the lyric that he misheard. And then the session was so rough, the band had to play it over a hundred times. The drummer was so pissed, he chucked the drumsticks at the producer. You gotta hear his story. Well, this drummer actually ended up singing the song even though the band had a lead singer. It became their biggest hit. The backstory of what brought the character to life in this classic, because it's based on a real person, is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever spent hundreds of quarters on Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Burger Time, Dragon's Lair, or Donkey Kong at the arcade, you're gonna dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of our daily dollop of nostalgia straight from the artist. Click the bell so you never miss out. Make sure to check that you're subscribed because some people think they're subscribed and they're really not. Man, that really helps us. Check us out on Patreon. That helps us to keep it a daily channel. Check out our merch as well. It's all about keeping the music alive. So for any true blue child of the 80s, if I happen to say the word motoring, you say, what's your price for flight? Of course, I'm talking about the course of the all-time classic rock hit, Sister Christian from the one and only Night Ranger. Gotta tell you, this song was my go-to as a kid. Whenever it came on the radio, it just it put a quarter in me and I was banging my head, I was raising my fist, I was singing really yelling the words full throttle. I'm not a violent person. I don't ever start fights. However, the only time I ever really instigated a fight with my little brother was over this song. Remember, we were riding in the cab of my dad's pickup. This song came blasting out of the radio and my brother punched the little metal button to change the station. I punched him in the throat and I changed it back. I berated him. I was like, it's against the law to change the station when this, this song's on, a Sister Christian. I was, and I'm still completely serious. But you're motoring. Yeah. If you hate this song, you hate babies, you hate kittens. It's just happiness and joy. That's what this song is, it's pure and unadulterated joy. It'll lift the saddest sack from their slumber. It's the musical equivalent of Jolt Cola, if you will. Anyway, Night Ranger formed in San Francisco. Their origin can be traced to Rubicon, pop funk group led by Jerry Martini. He was actually once part of Sly and the Family Stone. After Rubicon's demise in 79, bassist Jack Blades put together a trio with two other Rubicon members, drummer Kelly Keege and guitarist Brad Gillis. Uh, they performed under the name Stereo, and the threesome later added keyboardist Alan Fitzgerald, who once played with the hard rock outfit Montrose. This happened in 1980. From there, Fitzgerald brought in another ferocious guitarist in Jeff Watson, who at the time had his own band. As stereo, the band played some smaller clubs in San Francisco. In 1980, they changed their name to Ranger, finally Night Ranger, after a country band claimed trademark infringement. They dropped their first album, Dawn Patrol, on Boardwalk Records and started opening for major artists. There was Ozzy, there was also ZZ Top, Actually, most people don't realize that Brad Gillis played guitar for Ozzy after Randy Rhodes tragically passed away. Uh, interesting there. The record company Boardwalk shut down in mid-82. The Night Ranger signed with a subsidiary of MCA, Dawn Patrol's first single, Don't Tell Me You Love Me. That charted right at the bottom of the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Don't tell me you love me. Don't tell me you love me. But due to its music video, uh, the band Got some great exposure from it. Night Ranger's popularity continued to rocket with their sophomore album, Midnight Madness, that pushed the band to headliner status by the summer of 1984. The three singles from Midnight Madness solidified the band with Rockin' America, When You Close Your Eyes, of 
course, today's song, the top five smash, Sister Christian. Sister Christian, oh, the time has come. Which was not sung by lead singer Jack Blades, but by drummer Kelly Keegy. Coming up next, lead singer Jack Blade and drummer singer Kelly Keegy tell us the grand story of Sister Christian, how the song was actually not originally called Sister Christian. It was actually Sister, well, I'm going to let them tell you. It's really cool. And they also share what inspired them to get into rock and roll. So as we go into this interview, I do want to recognize our amazing sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, you won't find an eyewear company out there quite like Zenny. They're just one of a kind, with glasses that start at $6.95 for quality frames. You choose your color, your shape, your size, your style, put in your prescription, and you put in your address, they send them right to your door. Click up here on the info button to get yours today. We'll give you a special deal up to 80% off of regular retail prices. Here are the boys with the story of Sister Christian. Do you remember the first time that you heard your song on the radio? Tell me about that moment. Yeah, I think I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the moment that really hit, hit us was was the second time, um, our second album. Yeah. We were in the Bay Area, and, and, and the first album, Dawn Patrol, had become a pretty big hit. And then we released uh, Midnight Madness, and, oh, yeah. it, and it was instantly like, and it was, I remember being in San Francisco. Brad and I talk about this all the time. I was in San Francisco. There were like three rock stations, and then there was one in San Jose. So there was like four four rock stations. Mm -hmm. And I hit the I hit the thing, and w one of our songs, Touch of Madness, was playing on one. I hit another one, and You Can Still Rock in America was playing on one. I hit another one, and it was like When You Close Your Eyes, and I hit another one. It was another. Like at that moment, <laughs> at the very moment, Every radio station in the Bay Area was playing a Night Ranger song. It was like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh man, that was just, it just blew my mind. Oh yeah. I and mean, that was really, that was like, <laughs> yeah, okay, this thing's blowing up. Do you remember the first time that you heard your song on the radio, whether it was you singing lead vocal or just like that moment where, where you're like, guys, the song's on the radio. Oh, you know? Yeah, we were tell, calling tell us each that other. Story. And of course the Bay Area, they always embrace local bands. So the thing was playing on three different stations. And, you know, and we were like going, wow, this is great, right? And, you know, and the song would be over and we'd flip it and it would be playing, or another song would be playing. And we we're like, what is going on? Am yeah. I on the radio? And it was yeah. like, I mean, it was just like one of those surprise, incredible moments where you realize you're being played on the radio and it's, you know, and we were just calling each other and it was, it was <laughs> don't tell me you love me, of course. Sing Me Away was being played. That's where I remember. Sister Christian, oh, the time has come. So Sister Christian, that song, uh, of course, written by Kelly, but he was singing Sister Christine. Wasn't it you that tapped him and said, wait a second. Yeah, I thought it yeah, was he was tell saying. Tell us that story. Well, his sister's name is Christy, yeah. and, and he was singing like, Sister Christy all the time. I always thought he was saying Sister Christian. I'm like, that's freaking brilliant. Sister Christian. You know, I, I love the, 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 the look of that, you know, the how thought of that. that yeah, yeah. The, how, how lyrical and how, you know, poetic and how, you know, you, you just see a painting immediately, Sister yeah, Christian, yeah. you know. And, and then one day he wrote it down, Christy. I'm like, that's not, dude, what are you, Christy? And he goes, well, that's my sister. I said, I thought you were singing Chris, Sister Christian. He goes, no, no, it's... It's Christy, and I'm like, dude, poetic license. We, Kelly, we got to change it. Every day, I was uh, uh, living with a, a friend of mine in San Francisco, and every day we would play Bruce Springsteen's album. Um, uh, anyway, it had Racing in the Streets on it. Darkness on the Edge of Town. That's right, Darkness. Yeah. Every day we'd go right to that song because we were kind of doing a version of Sister Christian back then, but it wasn't what we, what we ended up with. But it was that that beautiful intro that and the song is about being in the street. So so that whole thing came about about cruising with my sister, wow. you know, uh, uh, cruising the main street. It was like a Van Nuys Boulevard, but it was in Oregon. And so it was about that. And so I tapped into that whole thing. You know, I got a 59 Chevy you know, and the whole thing. And I was like, I want to write a song like this. His sister, poor, poor Christy, she was like, should she change her name to Christian now? I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was like, you know, what's a, who, you know, tail wagging the dog or whatever it is yeah. that, you know, that saying is. It's kind of a big brother song. Because it totally, you, you it was really... totally about me, you know, to my sister saying, watch out because I've been there and we're after one thing and it might be okay, but 
I'm just telling you. You know? Yeah, kind yeah. Of Wake up and what you looking for. You know those boys don't want to play no more with you. It's true. It's cornered every market of entertainment. Video games, movies, and, and TV with uh, Glee. I mean, even Glee covered it. American Dad did a couple different episodes yeah. With, yeah. with that on there. Yeah, it was always fun. What's your price for flying? Yeah, and it just kind of took off. As come, you know, song kind of ended up in a collective consciousness of the... You well, know, the musical, the, Rock of Ages, in fact, you were yeah. in that musical yourself. Well, yeah, yeah, I actually <laughs> starred in the Vegas portion of that yeah. Yeah, as the club owner. It was pretty wild. To say, okay. Boogie Nights kind of put it back on the map, kind of like what Sopranos did for Don't Stop Believing. Well, I'll tell you, man, Boogie Nights, that was crazy. Kelly and I went, and went to see Boogie Nights. We went to see the scene, and we saw that scene sweat just started pouring out of our foreheads. We're like, we looked at each other and we go, we've been to that guy's house in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, really? We've lived that. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah. my God, this oh, is yeah. way too close to reality. Yeah. I mean, we were like, yeah, you know. <laughs> I love that song. Tell me about the drum fills, because that is one of the greatest moments in a pop song ever, when you're leading up to the chorus, the bum, 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 right, bum, right. bum. Where did you kind of... I mean, I, I, we wanted it to be as big and as bombastic and to build into this gigantic thing. And, and so that's where that, that, that kind of feel came. But it was the ending that happened totally spontaneous and only did it one time. And it was after... It must have been 3 o'clock in the morning. And we had to only record after 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So there was businesses, the studio, you know, it couldn't be used until later. And it was late, and I was like bush, and I was like done, and we'd been 10 tracks of this song. And every after every track, the, the, you know, the, the producer would go, let's do it again. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, build, it's like my temper's building, and I'm like, I'm like, you know, how can I do this over and over again, yeah. you know? I mean, I, I just wasn't that school of a, of, of a player to, you know, like a session musician could do it as many times as you want. So when I got to like the 10th take, and I got to that ending, I just, I threw down and I just said, this is just too much for me. So yeah. I did that whole ending and the ending ended up being a magical moment. It was this long pause and I, I just like do it. I just, I just hit it. I just hit it as hard as I could. And I threw my drumsticks across the room and they went <laughs> flying. And there was this long pause and the producer goes, come on in. And I went, okay. And then we went in there and he goes, come here, come here. He goes, I want you to hear this. And we listened to the whole song, and when it got to the ending, and it yeah. did that ending, I'm like, I don't think I could ever recreate that ever again. And he goes, we don't need you to. Oh, That's wow. the one we're taking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank God. What was it for you that kicked open the door to your mind and made you want to pursue music? Do you remember the moment? My older brother Jim had, was playing records. You know, music was just such a big part of his life. And it was Elvis Presley, Little Richard, and it was uh, stars like that, you know, um, uh, Chuck Berry. And all those songs were playing. Go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go. I knew that I wanted to see what this was all about. As the years went on, the next two or three years, I was in, I was in a band at seven. Wow. We were playing surf songs, so, you know. <laughs> So we were, try, you know, we were trying to figure it out. And by then, I think it was probably the Beatles and stuff like that just started to like manifest its like insanity in my brain. It became like this beautiful noise that I couldn't get rid of, you know?
you're kind of a rare thing, a singing drummer, but what, what brought you into playing drums? I mean, how did you know that was your instrument? Or? I didn't. I just knew that, that my, my buddy across the street was taking lessons. His cousin had a drum set that was stuck in the closet. And we discovered this drum set. And we just thought, well, I, you know, I never played drums before, but it was like, what if we brought that home and we and I tried to figure out and it was just like over the course of a couple of months, I started going, trying to accompany him while he was yeah. playing surf songs, ventures. Stuff like that. And I just figured it out, just like by ear. Wow. Know? So it was, it was kind of weird. I didn't have any symbols. I had a, a can, a tin can. It was the thing I was hitting like <laughs> for a symbol. So, you know. Um, so I was just making noise and I was yeah. just trying to figure it out. And, and there you go. And it was seven years old and I kept doing it. And some of your first bands, did you, were you always the singer behind the kid or did you? I, I was, I, I was always the guy that was singing. Everybody else would take turns, but I, I was always the guy that was like, let me take a, you know, in rehearsal, let me, let me take a shot at that. Cause I can imitate voices really well. That was one thing that I really picked up on uh -huh. early on is that I tried to like be, I tried to sing like little Richard. Yeah. You know, and that 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 gruff, heavy voice. And I was like, you trying to, you know, so so that, that was kind of the beginning of like me trying to figure out my own style. So it was those voices that I tried to Im emulate and imitate McCartney, of course, and early on when he was doing Little Richard songs. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, it was like, who knew, you know, it was going to turn out to be what this is. Yeah. Wonderful. So Rubicon, you, you started out in Rubicon. San Francisco, that's just such a rich musical heritage that maybe doesn't get the spotlight like a lot of other places, but like Bill Graham, because I've interviewed a lot of different people from, from Journey to Night Ranger to, to um, Santana and, oh, and Tower of Power and all those great, even Eddie Money, you got to start from Bill Terrific. Graham. You Absolutely. Know? And, and Bill was such a great part of that. Tell me a little bit about meeting Bill Graham and booking you and all that kind of thing. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Alan Fitzgerald, our original keyboard player, who was also a great bass player, and played with Ronnie Montrose and then Sammy Hagar. And he was, he was, you know, pretty much uh, in the beginning. We, mm -hmm. you know, he was connected with Bill Graham back then because of Ronnie and because of Sammy. And so we tried to get them to manage us early on before we had any deals or anything like that. So um, Alan you know, um, was pretty much on the forefront of like bringing Bill Graham in to see us and possibly, you know, like uh, manage us. So when Pat Benatar was doing her first tours in yeah. 79, um, also the Doobie Brothers, Santana did some shows out in Sacramento. We got put on there. So, so that relationship with Alan and Bill kind of helped us get started in the Bay Area with some big shows that you know, normally would unknown bands would, would, wouldn't get, or yeah. they, rarely. So the, that, that whole thing, I remember Bill with, with um, Pat Benatar, and mm -hmm. the first tour, we were playing in a club, and Bill came into our dressing room and just wanted to say hi. And, just, and so that was the beginning of that relationship, and he started telling these wonderful stories the way Bill, only Bill Graham can tell them. Talking about Zeppelin, and he was talking about you know, um, there was an English road manager that was giving us a hard time, took everything away in our dressing room. And, and, he, and, and suddenly Bill went and confronted that guy and said, what? Who told you to do that? Who, who are you? Maybe you should get out of here. You know, like, maybe we should throw you out right now. How about that? You know, and we were like sitting there going, you know, and, and, and it was all that energy directed to this guy because of us. Yeah. And then he would sit down and go, yeah, okay. And he shut the door and then he started to <laughs> be like normal guy, yeah. Bill Graham, who a lot of people didn't see that side of him because he yeah. had to be who he was. But so that was kind of the beginning of the relationship with Bill Graham and all that. So that's amazing. I want to ask you about one of your first singles of Night Ranger, Sing Me Away, which you wrote. <laughs> I think it was, you know, it was just like, you know, a normal kind of love lost, you know, uh, song. I was just kind of, uh, uh, you know, just feeling that, but, br but bringing it out emotionally. Today, 
Jack and I um, were writing the song. I brought the, the idea to him, and then he was helping me finish the lyrics, and then we came up with the title. But we were working for his mother-in-law, and yeah. we were in this museum, like the, the D. Young Museum in San Francisco. Wow. And we're sitting there, and we're decorating. It was in July, and we're decorating for Christmas because she had this, like, town and country uh, ad that she was going to be a part of. So she was, Jack and I were, like, setting up a Christmas tree in this, like, priceless antiques, you know, yeah. that, from the 1700s. And Jack said, I got this idea, you know, idea. What do you think? And, he's, and we start throwing ide- you know, ideas about the lyrics. And he sat down in the chair that was like dated like, you know, 1652 or whatever. <laughs> and it was like, Whoa. suddenly like security showed up and it was like, bah, bah, bah. And it's like, oh my God. And we're sitting there going, and she goes, get up, get up. What are you doing? This is insane. You can't sit in that chair. So I remember when we started to like, the lyrics started to, you know, come out and sing me away. And it was just about, I mean, you know, that story took precedent over what the lyrics were and what the song ended yeah. up being. But it was a, the second single, of course, and, and we were very proud that that song got out there because it's a pop song, but, but it still shows off what Night Ranger is all about. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment about Night Ranger, about Sister Christian. This is just one of those great songs from the 80s. Also leave us a comment about other arena rock bands. I miss those times. Let's have a happy little jaunt into 1984. Share some of the stories and some of the memories you have from this song and from this band. And if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. Every day we do this, we jump in the time machine and celebrate the great ones. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you.